Hello, this is Mr. White, and this video is on exponential modeling. And specifically, we'll be taking a look at radioactive half-life. So exponential modeling, that, that implies that we're going to use mathematics to describe or model real-world phenomena. And in the last video, I had a brief list, and, and certainly an incomplete list, of some real-world scenarios in which you can apply some exponential and or logistic functions mathematically. And interestingly, I left off a real common example that, that's usually, that's often used in classes. That is the subject for today's lesson, the radioactive half-life um, scenario. So we're in a new section, exponential logistic modeling. And just for a little history here, you may recall that just a few years ago, uh, there's a huge nuclear disaster in Japan. Uh, where there's an earthquake followed by a tsunami, and that resulted in a nuclear meltdown in which a lot of uh, dangerous chemicals were released into the, the environment. So according to this website that I found um, about a week after the, um, the crisis, these were the main radioactive substances, the radioactive isotopes that were being released into the um, environment. And notice that in each case, these substances have a half-life associated with them. Now, some of you may know from chemistry class what a half-life is, and you, you probably have, have the idea of what the concept is. Um, we're going to get more detailed into the mathematics behind it than you probably have before. So let's start real briefly with, uh, with, with the concept, make sure you're good on that, and then we'll get into the mathematics. So let's look at the cobalt-60 and the cesium-137. And what does it mean to have half-lives of 5.2 years or 30 years? Well. Um, just for the sake of making the math a little bit easier, let's take that five-year half-life of the cobalt-60, I'm sorry, the 5.2 years, and let's just round it off to five years. That'll make my job a little easier here. So for cobalt-60, it's got a five-year half-life. Let's see what that means. I'm going to graph the amount of this material, this substance, as a function of time. And since um, this half-life is on the order of years, my time will be measured in years. Um, if those were different units, if I had a half-life that was just several days or several centuries, I would adjust my horizontal axis units accordingly. All right, so uh, let's say that I start with um, eight grams of cobalt-60. And I chose that number because I just happen to have eight little increments, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight on the vertical axis. So I've got eight grams of material um, of, of cobalt-60 when I start counting. So that means I've got a point right here. At time t equals zero, I've got eight grams, right? So what does it mean to have a half-life of approximately five years? Well, if we count by fives on the horizontal axis, if I say that this is five and this is 10 and 20 and 30 and so on. Let me just get the rest of them down here all the way out to 60. What that means is that in five years, I will have half as much of it as I started with. So in five years, I will be down to four grams. Now, just to be clear, I'm not claiming that this stuff just evaporates into thin air. Um, what happens is that half of it chemically turns into um, some other non-radioactive form of cobalt, I believe. You'll, I'd ask that you ask your chemistry teacher. Um, that is certainly not my strength. But it becomes um, something other than cobalt-60. So it doesn't disappear. It just turns into something else. And I'm left with only 4 grams of the cobalt-60 after 5 years. Now, let's be clear what does not happen from here. Because every year there's some students that get this misconception that, well, if four grams disappeared in five years, then the other four grams will linearly go away in the next five years. Well, certainly not. This is not a linear uh, phenomena. What happens is that I look at the four grams that I have at this point, and that gets cut in half in the next five years. So when I'm at t equals 10, that four becomes two. And at 15 years, that gets cut in half again, down to one gram. And at 20 years, it's half of that. And so Every five years, I keep cutting down to, to, um, by a factor of one half. Now, let me point something out here while it's on my mind. When I had these two points up there, did that remind you of the last video when we were drawing an exponential function given just two points? Um, I hope it does, because we're going to use that same concept. 
So notice in this case, I got many more points, but even with just those first two points, I could have come up with my equation. So this is definitely a, a, a decreasing function, um, also called exponential decay in this case. Not my best piece of artwork right here, but you get the idea. And let's contrast that with the cesium-137, which has a half-life of 30 years. If I had started with the same 8 grams, it would not decay nearly as fast. It would take 30 years to get down to 4 grams. And after 60 years, I'd be down to only 2 grams. So it is decaying, but not nearly as fast. It's going to take a longer time to asymptotically get close to the horizontal axis. So they're both exponential functions. Um, and if we want to answer some questions about these substances um, and what happens to them over time, we need to come up with an equation. So here's our example. And, and actually, instead of using those substances, we're going to use this iodine-131. That was another one in the list um, that I showed earlier. So let's say you've got some iodine-131, and it's got a half-life of eight days. And for some reason, you insist on, on storing 100 grams of it in your refrigerator. Don't know why you do that, but it's your life. The questions that we are ultimately going to want to answer are, how much of it will be left in 20 days? And when will there be 5 grams left of it? Those are the two questions we ultimately want to answer. But before we can answer either of those, we need to come up with an equation. So again, I'm going to ask that you try to tie this into what we did in the last video, because it's absolutely relevant. And, and let me start building on the concept that we just addressed in the last slide. So I'm going to fairly quickly say that if I am starting with 100 grams of this uh, iodine-131, then if I'm graphing the amount as a function of time, I'm, I'm just going to do a very crude graph for this. I'm going to get a point here at 0, 100. And given this concept of half-life that we just discussed, if the half-life is 8 days, that means that in 8 days, now let me just do it this way, in 8 days there's going to be half that amount so in eight days, there will be half of the 100, or 50, left. All right, um, so let's proceed to do something similar to what we did last time. Remember last time, I'm just going to make a couple little tweaks to that process. Last time, we said y equals a times b to the x. And for, for these type of uh, real-world problems or word problems, I tend to like the function um, notation better. So I'm going to write m of t, uh, m for mass, um, that's left. Now there's nothing magic about the letter m, I'm just choosing it somewhat arbitrarily. So the mass, or the amount of material, as a function of time, will equal a times b. And instead of calling it x, we're dealing with the t axis now, right? t is our independent variable, time. So mass is a function of time, but other than this, it's the same setup. Now, we get a bit of a gift here in this process. And the gift is that um, in the last video, we chose two points, neither of which was necessarily on the y-axis. But the fact that one of these points is the y-intercept is really convenient for us, because look at what happens. When I take this point and I plug its uh, x and y, or, or t and m coordinates as it is, into this equation, I'm going to get the y value 100, or the m value, m of t, 100 goes here. And then when I do a times b, I put the x, or the t value, up here of 0. And do you see what's convenient about that? Any b value to the 0 power is going to give me 1. I don't even have to know what b is in order to see that a is 100. OK, so I've got my a value right off the bat very easily. So m of t equals 100. I can plug in the a. And now I just need to find out what b is. OK, so now I'm going to turn to the other point. I'm going to turn to, to this point right here, and I'm going to plug in those values. And I'm going to get 50, that's my y, or m of t value, equals 100 times uh, b to the eighth power. That's the, the half-life, and that was the amount of time that it took to get to 50 grams. All right, let me scroll down a little bit here. Um, so I'm going to do one thing a little bit differently than from last time as well at this point, or, or right after this point. I'm still, going to, um, I'm still going to divide by 100. I'm still divide this over. And, and then I will get, and notice that this side reduces to 1 half. 
Interestingly, I'm gonna ask you to keep an eye out for this. No matter what I start with, whether it's 100 grams or some other amount, this will always reduce to one half at this point in the process, interestingly. So kind of observe that. And what I've got at this point is b to the eighth equals 50 over 100 or one half. Now here's what I'm gonna do a little differently. I'm going to go ahead and raise both sides to the 1 8th power like I did last time, but I'm just going to leave it like that. I'm going to say, I'm going to leave it at b equals 1 half to the 1 8th. I'm not going to reach for the calculator this time. And I'm going to plug that in. Let me move over to the left here. I'm going to plug that in, and I've now got an equation for mass or amount as a function of time. I've got m of t equals a, 100, times b, which is one-half to the one-eighth power, and then that is raised to the t exponent. Don't forget this t out here. Every year there are always some students who, who, for whatever reason, forget the t. And using our exponential properties about the one other thing I might do this, I don't insist upon it, but I'm going to do it here, is I'll use my exponential properties to say that I can multiply that one-eighth and that t and just get t over eight. So even though I'm not totally done yet, this is a pretty significant milestone, so I'm going to put a box around that. That is the mass as a function of time, and we're going to find it's pretty smooth sailing from here if we are going to allow ourselves to do this graphically, which, which I will. Um, later on in the next section, we'll discuss how we might solve something like this algebraically, but for now, let's just do this graphically. I want to use that equation to figure out how much iodine, there, iodine 131, there's going to be in 20 days. So go to the calculator and let's type it in. And I've already done that here. 100 times 1 half or 0.5 to the t over 8 or x over 8 power. And the first thing you'll notice is that if you just use one of your standard zoom settings, if you just go to like zoom standard or something and, and, and graph that, you're not going to see anything. Well, let's consider why. When I go back to my sketch, my sketch up here, look at the coordinates of those points. Those are fairly big coordinates. To be, um, they're not going to fit on this standard screen. So I need to go to Window, and, and I hope you're getting comfortable with this by now, of deciding how to set your window settings. Here, I see that my half-life is 8. So let me set this to several half-lives. Let's go to 8, 16. Let's go to 24. I want to see at least that far. I don't really, I'm not really interested in seeing into the past, so let's just make this x min negative 1. Uh, as far as y values go, I, I'm also not interested in really negative y values, but I would like to see um, up to 100. So let's put 110 here. Uh, I'm going to make my interval 10. And now I can clearly see my exponential decay. If I uh, trace to 0, I see, yes, I'm at 0, 100 like I expected. If I trace to 8, I see I'm at 850. If I trace to 16, I see that I'm at um, half of that 50 or 25. And remember what our question was? How much will there be in 20 days? Well, let's just trace to 20. And that's how much there is in 20 days. So let me scroll down here, bring this down here. It's getting a little bit cluttered, but believe it or not, we're almost done. So I'm going to write in function notation that the mass of the material in 20 days is approximately equal to, when I round off to four sig figs, 17.68 grams. And that will be my answer to part A. Again, we could do this algebraically or, or non-graphically, but I'm going to do it graphically for now. Uh, now, in this case, notice that I was given this value, the independent variable, and asked to find the dependent variable, and that was very straightforward. But notice for part B, it's reverse. I'm asked, when will it be 5 grams? So remember how we handle that? We go to the calculator, and we go to y equals, and we say, I'm going to put 5 as y2, and I'm going to do calc intersect. However, notice I haven't gone over far enough to see um, the intersection, so I need to change my window settings, and I'm just going to do a bit of an educated guess here and say, I'm going to guess that if I go out to 50 days, that that should be enough. Um, there, are, there are, you know, a little more intelligent ways to go about that, but I'm going to just leave it at that for right now. And it's getting a little bit hard to see what's going on there, but let's, let's try this calc. Um, actually, one thing I would like to do is clear myself a little bit of room here on this y min. 
so I, so I can see the, the, the writing at the bottom. You'll see what I mean in just a moment. I'm going to go to calc intersect and wait for it to redraw here. And I'm going to intersect those two graphs. And you should be, remember, we don't have to spend a lot of time messing with the cursor. Just hit enter, enter, enter at this time. And there I see the answer to the second part of my question. I see that in 34.58 days, that's when I'm going to get the five grams of substance that I want. So my answer goes here. The mass at 34.58 days is what gives me the five grams. So in part A, the answer was this part um, that I was looking for. In part B, this is where my answer was. Hope that made sense. Let's have you give it a try. Let's say you're headed out west to my home state of California, and you get some Californium-254. That's an actual substance. Um, and that it has a half-life of 60.5 days, and you've picked up 7 kilograms of it. How much is there in 100 days, and when will there be 0.25 kilograms left? Have at it. Pause the video at this time. All right, if you've uh, um, completed this, hopefully you got this answer. That after 100 days, we've got 2.226 kilograms left. And how long did it take to get 0.25 kilograms? It took 290.8 days. Okay, in the next chapter, we will um, learn that we could have gotten that T value, that 290.8, algebraically, and it would look something like this with logarithms. But we will save that for another day. Come on to office hours if anything didn't make sense, please.